Today's guests are indie and post-rock band, record label owners, and all-round lovely chaps, Robert Stephen Glover, Benjamin Thomas Holton, collectively known as Epic 45. How are we doing, boys? Hello. Good, right. yeah. How, how has 2020 been, guys? Like, I know you had, uh, obviously, the, a Japan tour that got cancelled, but you still seem to have put out a lot of music this year. So how has it been for you? It's been pretty weird. I guess um, it's weird in in many ways because it's the first year where we've released two albums. I think in one year, I think that's the first time we've we've done that. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, and and then not been able to play live at all. Yeah. Um, so there's two kind of new things this year, <laughs> where one's a bit crap. Um, but in, yeah, in terms of you know releasing music it's been good you know we've, we're happy, really happy with the the albums we've released um but just sad about not being able to play and especially in japan yeah it's been obviously a, yeah funny one we had i think we had we had a lot of plans really for this year with the two records and i think we'd always intended hadn't we to release these two in pretty quick pretty quick succession but yeah, as you say, just the the fact of not being able to tour this stuff, and especially because the Japan tour had been a few years in the in the in the planning, really, and we were all set, and we had the tour booked, and we had the flights booked, and and then yeah, literally two months beforehand, we had to to cancel cancel the lot. But it did give us, you know, I suppose it did give us time to really, you know, focus on getting the two albums released, and you know, and done as best we could. Really, we were able to carry on as a label. And uh, yeah, so that was a good that was a good thing, I suppose. It's that weird thing where like I've I've known you both for like ten years now, and it's always seemed like Japan was going to be next year. It's like oh yeah, and next next year we might be going to Japan, and it's always been this sort of fabled thing. And then this year was finally the year, and I was so happy for you both. And then yeah, <laughs> the world went mad. Yeah, yeah. Um... And obviously, in more ways than one, as well. We uh, we were talking earlier about um, touring again and wanting to get back, doing some gigs again. And obviously, there's there's the, the Europe thing now, which has become uh, another another wall in yeah, between well, us being able to yeah. kind of uh, do what we used to do and maybe build on it and and get better at it and do more of it. Now it's become uh, or threatens to become ridiculously difficult to do that yeah um, which is yeah. another blow <laughs> so yeah like we in the past where you've just sort of popped to france for a day or two to do a gig that like mo- that might not be anywhere near as easy anymore is it oh absolutely not no no i mean those yeah we often do little flying gigs we did madrid i think istanbul and a few others and uh, they're really nice really lovely self-contained little trips away with a gig at the end but we weren't able to do those easily at all without loads of complications, I don't think, and loads of cost as well for us and the promoters. So I just don't know how feasible that's going to be for a while, for a good while. So uh, stay tuned for Epic 45 doing lots of UK tours for the... Yes, uh... loads in the UK. <laughs> um, and then you, you both own Wayside and Woodland Recordings, your, your record yeah. label. Um where did that come from? Did that come out of necessity of not having a label or being unhappy with old labels? Um, well, it wasn't a necessity as such because when it when we first came up with the idea of uh, Wayside and Woodland, we were we were still releasing music under the Make Mine Music label, which is a collective, uh, cooperative kind of uh, label. However, I think we there was never like well the idea was there was never like a boss or anything we would release uh what we wanted to but i think everyone kind of had to kind of agree that they were happy with it i I, with the release i think that was meant to be the plan um but hmm gotta be careful what i say really Uh, no i mean i don't there was no i there there was never any like T- tyrannical uh, leadership issues going on. I just think we we had a few projects, musical projects that we thought, I don't know, 
just maybe didn't fit, fit the label. Not even that, really. We just we just wanted to do something disconnected from it. So um, that was it. You know, solo projects, things like that. So uh, we just thought, oh, let's set up. Let's have our own little label. It wasn't a big idea. It wasn't like it, the idea wasn't for it to be a a massive going concern kind of thing. But uh, then, mate, my music kind of ended a couple of years later, we, and we had our label there. Kind of, we, you know, in its infancy, but it was there already. So that was a, that was a, turned out well. I think we'd always daydreamed, hadn't we? As, even as kids, of having our own record label and releasing our own records ourselves. So it was a natural, a natural thing to set up our own, our own at some point. And I made my music was fantastic for years. It was a lovely cooperative venture, but uh, and it naturally ran its course, I think. And as Ben says, we had this structure, loose structure, to then use for our other projects, which maybe wouldn't have suited make my music, or you know, we just maybe wanted a bit more freedom to say, well, let's we want we want to put me and Ben want to put this out, uh, and it gave us that platform to be able to do that, you know, straight away. It's the interesting thing where it's like I spoke to Dom Jolly earlier in the year and he said about the 11 o'clock show where it was like lots of people came together and sort of learned how to make TV there. Like it wasn't necessarily the best TV in the world, but that's where everyone sort of learned how to do it. Is that what you feel about like Make My Music? Is it like it sort of taught you the, the ground level stuff? Yeah. I think we learned a lot, hell of a lot from it. I think as a, as a cooperative, we learned a hell of a lot. Uh, but it also, yeah, it meant we we understood to to a point the, the mechanics of everything and how you you know how you press a record, how you market a record, how you distribute a record. So we learned a hell of a lot from it, and it was great, a great experience in that. And we had a lovely group of us that all fed and supported each other throughout all that, and we all shared knowledge and experience, and so that helped build you know a nice uh, you know idea of how we could do things ourselves, really. Yeah. What, what for you, what makes Wayside and Woodland different to other labels? You know, obviously you take a lot of care. You only have to look at any of your releases to see how much like effort you put into the presentation of things and the nice digi packs that you do. Is it things like that, do you feel, that set you apart? I think, um, yeah, I think we have, we appreciate, um, artwork and things like that and have always with epic 45 and our other projects we've always seen it as a massive part of a release to have something you know evocative and uh fitting for the for the music so the art has always been a big big part of it and and packaging it's got to, you know it's got to feel good in your hand you gotta have something to look at and, and absorb um yeah um I think uh, it's hard to pinpoint really what what I think makes it unique. I think I mean it's, it's an incredibly personal label. Uh, really, we're not trying to um, we're not trying to take over the world with it or anything. Um, the things that have come out on it are either um, projects that Rob and I have worked on uh, that we you know we give a home. Or projects from friends that we uh, we want to support and we like. Um, it's always exciting hearing music from from good friends of ours. And then other things we've released, they are either other friends we've made along the along the way, or artists that we really admire and really wanted to re- uh, release something of. So Mark Van Hoen was quite a big thing for us. Um, you know, I. I see him as quite a legendary figure, really, in uh, you know electronica and uh, that kind of experimental post rock type stuff. So that was brilliant. Um, Richard Young's, um, I mean, I, I, I just, I, I think he's great, and um, it was an honour to to do a record. But they, you know, and it's, so it's all very. I mean, I suppose all labels to a degree uh, have that personal drive, but. Um, yeah, it's it just all feels you know it's very very close to us really how we how we how we put it out there. Yeah, yeah, and I think that was important. I think that was you know important from the start. Really, we were helping to support friends' music as well who hadn't had a release out maybe before, but and they they would often invariably be members of the Epic Forty Five live band, 
uh, you know, people like Eric and Mike, whose music we, we loved, their solo stuff was, was great and didn't necessarily have a home, but we were able to help them and support them and get their music released. And uh, I, think, I think in lots of ways it was important for us, especially in the early days, to actually really know who we were working with. I think that can, has been the problem at various points with us over the years where you're working with labels and people across the other side of the world and you don't really know them outside of an email or two. Really, so for us, it was a deeply personal thing, and yeah, it was we're able to release music by our friends and whose music we, you know, loved. That's brilliant, man. That's brilliant. It's like you using the platform that you pair have been able to build over the years to sort of you know bring some other people up with you. That's that's a really cool way of using you know your influence. The past few years, you've both left the countryside. You've both moved out of uh, Wheaton Aston, which is obviously the home of Epic 45 for many years. Do you feel that that's changed how you make music or how you work together? I, I guess so to a, de- to a degree. I mean, I think in the last few years, we've hit a nice stride in how we how we do work together, which even though we only live, what, four miles apart, we don't live far from each other now. But we both have nice home setups, so it's just very easy and we have a nice way of working where we can very quickly bash ideas back and forth over Dropbox to each other and we can have we can be exchanging you know uh, parts of a track over you know the course of an afternoon and and sculpting a track remotely uh, which is which is great I mean doesn't you know it's always lovely to get together in the same room and work on work on things of course but there's a nice there's a nice uh, immediacy I think to work in how we do with our home setups and just bashing ideas back and forth over Dropbox yeah, I think in many ways we're working better together than we ever have. Really, it's I don't know why yeah, that yeah. should be, I, but um, it just seems it just I don't know. It seems kind of effortless now and, and flows, yeah, yeah. Uh, beautifully. It's just yeah. But in, in terms of uh, living somewhere different, I think that I think it's definitely had an effect and i think i think it's going to those and it's bound to um it's bound to influence you know what you're working on um i don't know i would say on especially on the, the recent stuff you can see that it's there like in the artwork and some of the themes and things like that and, and what we're working on at the moment yeah it seems to have shifted from sort of more countryside themed stuff to being more like suburbia and yeah you know, over the last few years yeah yeah I and mean, i guess that's where we that's kind of where we live now I mean, we don't we don't live right in the middle of any cities either of us at all we both live on the periphery of uh, of wolverhampton really and that kind of conurbation of, of the west midlands so we're both in kind of spitting distance of the countryside still so we still have access to that and to the to the outdoors and to the, to the countryside uh but I think you're right. I think there is a slightly more pull towards the suburban and the creep of it all. In between uh, 2011 and 2018, you had a seven-year hiatus from Epic 45, where you both put out solo albums and stuff. Do you do you feel like that was important to Epic 45 to have that break? from the albums do you think you both learned something from that break i definitely i well i I won't speak for both of us but i think it's true i because of the nature of what i was working on where i was trying to basically i was you know trying to evoke my love of you know classic pop and things like that um it just i taught myself a few kind of production techniques i guess um not by sitting down and studying them but just by experimenting trying to get certain uh, results and things and i think it just made me a bit of a better producer i guess um so that when we eventually came back to doing epic 45 i think um it was yeah i could just achieve things uh more successfully than i than i could before so yeah it definitely definitely helped uh, and also as a performer as well, um, I did a lot of solo gigs, um, and I don't know what what was going on. I, I never felt nervous or anything like that. I just kind of did it. It was very strange looking back to it now. I don't know what was going on. 
but uh, I did these. I mean, I played on my own in the Union Chapel, just me and my guitar. Like, I can't, you know, it seems crazy thinking back to that, but I was just like, yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, that's definitely helped um, the live side of things as well. Yeah, it was a strange period, but necessary and natural. It, it all happened for a reason, I guess, for it just happened naturally and... Yeah, I mean, there was certainly no breaking point with Epic Forty Five at all, really. I, I, there was no sort of particular moment that, where it ended. It was just, I think, it was a natural thing. I think our lives sort of shifted slightly around that time as well, really. And uh, and I think for both of us, I think we both had a, a, a an itch to scratch in terms of working on some pop music, which we just still do, and are both adored since we were young kids, whether it be you know guitar based or, or synth pop or whatever. You know, that's something that we both loved and. I'd both played with for years anyway, little demos and little things. We'd show each other, make each other laugh, just having a go at trying to mimic something that we loved. So it was always there, I think. And I think for both of us, it was it was an important little exercise in in scratching that uh, that itch, really. But as Ben says, I think it's the same for me as well. It's uh, you know we both learned a lot in terms of production and and how to achieve certain results quicker. So by the time we've come back to Epic Forty Five, going back to what we were saying earlier, I think how we're working now is incredibly smooth and pretty quick and immediate and not too laboured and that's that's good that's that's a really good thing it was a it was a confidence boost i think in in many ways it was and and i think we also having that break it and having that time away from it and you know i think it made us really realize how important epic 45 is to us um no, i don't you know not that we'd massively lost sight of it but it, it, for several reasons it needed to it just needed that little breathing space and nothing was ever going to happen because I, I i did sit i did try to start a few things but you know i knew i just felt it's not the time and then eventually it just was and it was like coming home it was just like oh yeah this is god this is what i love doing and i think we both feel like that it's great yeah absolutely. i love it so with the newfound fondness for suburbia and the uh, the little bit of sort of more dancey influence that your solo project Field Harmonic brings, Rob, is uh, is how we get to this, I assume. Uh, and, and it's there as well. Uh, Crop in the Aftermath, your most recent album. It's uh, it's slightly different from the others. Like where where did it come from? Where did the idea of adding sort of more dance and jungle elements to Epic 45 have come from? I think it's something we've talked about for years. Uh, it's kind of, um, it, yeah, I think it's been on the cards for a while. Um, you know, and if, you know, dotted around in the, in the, some of the old songs, you can hear little bits, bits and bobs in there of uh, the odd kind of break beat and what have you, but, I can't remember exactly where we started to a couple of years ago. I, I, but it, 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 this, this idea of um, drawing on certain periods in the nineties, um, and I think we cover quite a lot of the nineties, or even even the late eighties. Um, you got kind of acid house, um, the kind of early breakbeat stuff, and, and then the later nineties drum and bass, and some of the garage stuff that was coming in in the late 90s and um and i think you know we we yeah it just seemed like a good idea to 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 use that as a palette uh to to make some songs with um and it yeah just happened i don't know (laughs) (laughs) it just happened (laughs) yeah we just did it yeah, I don't. Yeah, I mean, I don't remember a fixed point where we all some became. You know, we're going to use, start using, you know, these kind of uh, break beats and stuff. I think it, I think it was a natural thing, and I think probably both of us started to do the odd track, and, and we were dead excited by it. I think, which is uh, usually a good sign. I think if we I think if we, you know, we, we're both dead excited by a sound or a palette that comes about quite quickly, then that's probably a good thing and something we should run with. Uh, but I don't remember a fixed moment where that became like, ah, yeah, we need to tap into that it was just i think it was quite organic and you know built over messages and walks and the idea of it sort of 
cemented in our heads and then you know pre-lockdown when we could meet up we would just it would be quite you know it'd be quite fun just to sort of throw some of these rhythms around and see what see what stuck and then ben would chop them up a bit more and you know within a few days we'd have this new new track for the album so it was, it was pretty, pretty organic again i think yeah yeah um and that's usually the way really these these things start from just i guess kind of playing around and then it, it just it starts to dawn on you oh, hang on these are hanging together this is this is like this is they're all working together here um what's going on and then and then it just i don't know it comes to you, you start thinking oh yeah it's the it's those i think i you know little things like i found a tape that my my brother recorded at some point in the 90s with uh like a really local um pirate radio station playing uh kind of i suppose kind of acid no no not acid house a bit later but just kind of house music type stuff and him and his bunch of mates are ringing in and getting a track dedicated to them and stuff and it's all very kind of euphoric and slightly ramshackle sounding and there was just an energy about that that it's just really oh, it's just I think they were really exciting times and obviously we were too young I think to uh, kind of experience it but it was that I certainly from my older brother uh, both of them at points I heard all this um, drum and bass and jungle and acid house stuff um, and my brother used to make drum and bass music so it, it, it was, it's it's part of the DNA I think and has been has been for a while so it's yeah makes sense yeah I mean those sort of times I think with like you know your brother and his friends would just just pre us me and Ben starting to work on music together you know in the early, uh, mid mid nineties, those sort of formative years when we're starting to learn to play the guitar and looping a sample of a beat and trying to make something ourselves, really. So I think it might have it fed in at that point. As Ben said, his older brother, who would make music on his Amiga, you know, and get a loop together. And I remember, I remember, I'm sure Ben does as well, just being amazed that he'd looped a beat and it went round and he could press a button and it would keep on going. And it seemed like it seemed like witchcraft. It seemed just like ma- magical. And how have you done that? And can, can I have a go, please? Can, can, can I? Oh, okay. And uh, obviously, we went in a completely different direction um, ourselves. But I think that was absolutely like an influence though, those times. And it's nice to kind of track back to that point for us, I think, as well, and sort of pay a little bit of uh, tribute to that time. Do you feel it's taken this long for you to sort of build up the confidence, maybe, to sort of? so blatantly add that kind of like you know you've got a loyal fan base who will follow you now rather than going okay we're two albums in here's a you know drum and bass influenced album or is that something you need to have done after 15 years and a you know a whole load of albums no i don't think it's as conscious as that really i think the albums have happened the way they have um just yeah, I don't. I don't think. Uh, I don't think there's ever been a like a. a um, certainly not with that specifically in mind. I mean, maybe to a de- yeah, I will admit, possibly to a degree, there's been points where we've been like, oh God, we can't do that. And maybe yeah, listening to the, to this new thing, if you'd have, uh, it's possible. It's, you know, we possibly wouldn't have uh, released something like this a few years ago. Um, I just don't think we care as much now. It's just like we do. We make something. That's what we've made. That's it. That's what you're getting. Um, and things are changing again. Like um, the stuff we're working on uh, at the moment, it will be different again. And that's the beauty of it, really. There's no. It doesn't matter. You know, we're not. Uh, I think like. People that get it and people that kind of like what we do and like what we have done, they'll they'll always kind of hear us in whatever we do. Um, I felt the same about bands that uh, and artists that I've liked over the years. I, I'm I'm excited to hear them do things differently. Um, why would you want someone to just do the same thing over and over again? You know, um, it's it's good to it's good to kind of. Well, ultimately, you've just got to follow what you 
want to do as a as an artist and don't curb it uh because you think it might it might upset someone or it might like lose some fans uh, just that's very silly i think yeah to, part of what ben was saying is very true i think i think a lot of our fans and we built up a lovely fan base over the last 20 plus years now and i think a huge proportion of our fans i think they trust us i think they trust what we do i think we we never stand still in the albums that we release and i think we often turn little corners and surprise people. But I think people trust us. I think people, you know. <clears throat> that said, um, I think we probably did horrify some people with the My Autumn Empire and uh, Field Harmonic stuff. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I often wonder what if we'd just put it all out as Epic 45. I wonder how that would have gone, gone down. Um you know, because it's still us, isn't it? It's still us yeah. making music. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. But you know, I know, I know for a fact. Some, you know, I've had people come up and tell me, like, oh, I don't really like that album you did. I'm glad you did. Yeah. Didn't do any of those songs tonight. Yeah. I'm like, oh, Thanks. Cheers, mate. Or like, you know, I, I like your last album, but I don't, don't really don't like the last track. That shouldn't have been on there. Um, Get rid of it. It's I don't just, like it. Just... Yeah, it's like yeah. so. Yeah, I don't know. That uh, that was a yeah. I think in terms of epic, 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 yeah, epic forty five stuff though. I think yeah. I think generally, people trust what we do. I think, or you know, enough people yeah. fo- follow and and you know come along with us for you know for the ride. <laughs> well, I you know I, I obviously because I know a little bit more behind the scenes, but you sold out of the vinyl of the new album mm. before it had even. Come out, yeah. And, you know, just on pre orders, yeah, yeah. you'd sold out. Yeah, well, that was a big surprise, I think, to to all of us, really. I mean, it's you know, we've caught wind over the last few years that vinyl sales are up, and uh, I suppose we'd never really first had first hand experience of that what, that wave of things, really. We had moderate sales of, of vinyl, and it's that been good, but for whatever reason, this time round, yeah, we, the the you know, it was admittedly limited run we did sold out, yeah, eight weeks before the release date, and you know. <laughs> Sort of forced our hand to, in terms of repressing it straight away, which was great. You know, I think we've sold, if not more vinyl than CD this time, which is the first time that's ever that's ever been a thing, quite possibly. With hardly any major uh, press coverage at all, as well, which is another interesting uh, thing. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> But that's great, isn't it? That proves that you have got a loyal fan base and that, you know, the the people that like you will write about you or play your tracks without having to have a radio plugger do that job for you. you Oh, yeah. Yeah. People that choose to write about us, to write a review, to put us on an internet radio station... um, you know, put us in a playlist or something just because they want to, not because, you know, someone's kind of suggested it to them or uh, it's on a list of things that they pick. You know, they've done it because they've, a lot of the time, they've bought the album and they, they, they're passionate about it and they have their own uh, blog or whatever. And that means so much. It really does. Um you can't, it's, you can't really kind of buy that um, or pay for that. That just it, just, it, it happens and it, it's brilliant. We're really, really thankful for that. Anyone that does that, it's awesome. So what's next for for Epic 45 and for Wayside? You know, what have you got anything planned? Is there anything on the cards? Yeah, well, we went out for a walk today and we're having good chats really about next year. What that might bring. I mean, we just hope, I think, in lots of ways that gigs can start happening again in some form. At the very least, we can start getting together soon and start playing as a band, you know, the three of us with James Yates, our, our uh, drummer. Um, we'd just love to be able to do that soon and with a view of playing some gigs again in this country. Uh, who knows? Who knows? But things looking maybe promising from spring onwards. We don't know. We don't know. Obviously, this year we have. You know, we've not obviously not gigged for obvious reasons. But we have, you know, we've released two records, and I think we'd like to push, especially cropping aftermath further. And we'd love because we haven't been able to tour it. So there's still that that 
tour, you know, we'd love to do and play that those tracks live. We just, you know, we had, you know, we, we'd been building up ideas and thoughts and plans to to perform those songs live for months and months, and we were just on the verge of starting rehearsals for all that. And so I think in the in the immediate future, I think we'd just like to get the live band together and work out those songs with a view of playing them, fingers crossed, from spring onwards in the UK to start with. Yeah, and I don't know whether to to say it because when you say something's going to happen, you curse it, don't you? But there isn't. We have got an idea of um, putting a video together of some uh, of a live performance. Um, you know, obviously in lieu of people being able to come and see us, um, we're, we're kind of floating the idea maybe of a of like a live stream gig, like like they, they do nowadays. Um, but we'll see. But there'll definitely be some kind of um, visual performance, I think, at some point in the not too distant future. Um, there's, we've, I mean, you know, without giving too much away, there's obviously th- we're going to be still pushing the album next year. Um, maybe get some remixes um, sorted because I think it's quite, it's quite good stuff for remixes. Um, so that's that, and then we've got a. A single planned as well, um, stroke possible EP, which is a sidestep really from cropping. Um, and we've got um, a couple of nice guests, guest singers that we've been working with. So there's a bit of a, a tip for you, Sorry. something coming up. Um, so yeah, stuff stuff will be happening in yeah. 2021. Yeah, I just think yeah. There'll be more recording, more you know, working on this EP, finishing that, and the next album, and hopefully playing live, yeah, and touring, cropping the aftermath, which we can't wait to do. Awesome. Now, there's a question that I ask all of my guests, and uh, I'm going to put it both your way. Uh, <laughs> some of the answers we've had so far are Ricky Gervais, Robert Smith, and Steve Guttenberg from Cocoon. So, Rob, Ben, who's the most famous person you've sent a text message to? Ooh, most famous. I've I've got one, I, I think, but we might have the same one. So if you say it, then I'm screwed. No, you no, you go, you you go, you go ahead. I'll have a I'll have a think in the meantime. Yeah, it just immediately came into my head. Um, I feel like there's someone else brilliant that I'm not going to be able to think of. But anyway, it, for me, it's probably Stephen Wilkinson, a.k.a. Bibio, the international uh, success on Warp Records. I've texted him quite a lot, although I can't anymore because I lost his number. <laughs> uh, God, most famous. I don't know. <laughs> Is it famous to me, I think, would be probably Chris Adams from Hood. Okay. Uh, when we we put them on in Birmingham, when was that? Now, Ben, like two thousand five, I think. Yeah, it was yeah. Uh, so it was about fifteen years ago uh, when they released when Hood released their Outside Closer album. And we put them on in Birmingham, and uh, I remember having Chris's te- you know mess- uh, number, and we were just texting back and forth about when they were arriving and you know and details about the gig. Uh, so yeah, I think for me on a very personal level, Chris from Hood. I say it's specific text as well because I know you pair have both got really cool emails, but I'm not interested in your cool famous emails. It's text. Yeah. Text. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, where do people go if they want to find out more about Epic Forty Five and Wayside and Woodland? Where where should we send people? Uh, Wayside and Woodland dot com. Uh, I think that's got pretty much all the links to. To everywhere, every you know, like the band camp, um, to any individual sites, I think they should all be linked from there. There is an epic45.com that, to be fair, we do need to kind of overhaul that a little bit. Um, and we will, we will, We've, we have plans for that, um, you know, to create a, a non social media space for. for for things to you know, occur and live. So, but yeah, wastesodandwoodland.com, I 
I'm pretty sure that's pretty much everything. Is there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, nothing outside of that. Just yeah, just look at our Bandcamp page, really, and that's where we put all our, all our label releases and all the epic stuffs on there, digitally and physical copies as well. And uh, like a lot of people have been doing, you know, this year with Bandcamp and how Bandcamp's been operating with their their Friday, uh, you know, their first Friday of the month Bandcamp days, where you know all the artists get one hundred percent of the revenue. Uh, I think that's been that's been great. That's been a real good thing of this year. You know, and I think we've seen that ourselves. And uh, yeah, I mean, keep checking that because I think we, we do plan to keep putting stuff through that, you know, every few months, really. New things, exclusive things, things from the archives. So uh, yeah, that's worth keeping an eye on as well. Awesome. Guys, thank you ever so much for talking to me. Thanks, man. Thank you. Embarrass yourself, Mark!